Hey everybody, welcome to Coffee Break. Today's mug is the uh, Chincoteg Island Coffee Mug and horses and stuff, and I've had this for many, many years. Actually, I think I might start publishing an address to send interesting coffee mugs to it, and we would feature them on the show. If you're interested in sending me a cool coffee mug, uh, I would definitely appreciate that. So it's been an interesting week. Last week, you're watching this on Monday morning, but I'm actually recording on a Sunday. And I actually got to watch some movies that I have been wanting to see for some time. I'm going to do a very, very quick review. I, I like to call this part my Rogue Founder Weekend. So I got to see Rogue One, Star Wars Rogue One, and then also uh, The Founder, and then finally Hidden Figures. And these are all fantastic movies. I want to start with this right here. I actually went out and bought it on uh, Blu-ray, and it came with the digital download code as well. I think Disney is doing that on their movies. I've been a big fan of Star Wars. When the original Star Wars, that would be what, Episode Four: A New Hope came out in 1977. I had just graduated high school and went and seen that movie. And it was just a phenomenally successful movie. And all, all the rest of them have been really good, except I don't really, I didn't really care for um, the first the the prequels that much except for episode three uh revenge of the sith i guess what it's called uh, but this is a fun movie and i think that the first half of the movie though was kind of disjointed a lot of cuts to different planets and uh it was kind of hard for me to follow for about that first half hour or so I also thought they could have did a whole lot more with the char character saw guerra saw guerra uh, which was played by Forrest Whitaker, who, who did an amazing job. I, I just wish they would have done more with that character. The battle scenes were great. It was, I think the best part of the movie for me was uh, Darth Vader making a somewhat humorous, corny joke of his as he's strangling some poor guy. Really, really good stuff. So I think that was the best part of the movie. I would say that it did justice uh, as an homage to the original Star Wars Believable as a prequel somewhere between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. So I, I think they accomplished what they set out to do. It looked good. The cinematography was excellent. So I'm going to give that three stars out of five. Uh, not the greatest Star Wars movie, but uh, I put it right on par with uh, the last episode of Star Wars. Um, so there you have my take on that. I was more interested in watching The Founder. This movie was not broadly released. Now this is a movie featuring Michael Keaton as Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. Now I use that term very loosely because actually McDonald's was founded by two brothers, uh, Richard and Maurice McDonald. And at the time, Ray was a uh, down on his luck milkshake uh, machine salesman. And he was a kind of a serial entrepreneur, constantly, more of a huckster, constantly trying his hand at one thing and another. And finally, he stumbled upon the uh, McDonald's uh, brothers and ultimately talked them in letting him taking over franchising the restaurant. And then the movie kind of digresses more to his, as he becomes more successful, um, as he becomes more of a liar and a cheat and eventually would uh, cheat the McDonald brothers out of an estimated over $100 million or more. Uh, he also asked his wife, a suffering, long-suffering wife of many years, to, for a divorce so he could trade her in for a newer, prettier model, so to speak. It did not paint Ray Kroc in a good light. But the one thing it does is it shows you the point where he realizes that his business ain't hamburgers, baby. It's real estate. The last movie that I want to talk about is Hidden Figures. Now, this is a story of three African-American women employed in the 19, early 1960s by NASA. And they faced a double whammy. Being women and being African-American was a hindrance to any kind of promotions, even getting their own bathrooms. The cinematography was again very, very excellent on this. The scoring on it was great, but the story was absolutely superb. This is more if you're into real life or slice of life movies or docudramas, that I think this movie is right up your alley. It was definitely worth the awards that it's received. The acting was first rate. I can't speak highly enough about this movie. I would give this a four and a half star rating. It's right up there for one of the best films. Of, I have seen in many, many, many years. 
I'm not much into a lot movies that are based on superheroes, have lots of CGI and that sort of thing. I tend to prefer movies that are more a slice of life and based on historical facts and hidden figures just is totally on point across the board. These women are definitely responsible or partially responsible for America reaching the moon. We designed ourselves into a thermal corner. Famous words from Phil Schiller. He is the marketing director of Apple. Now, what am I talking about? Now, a while back, I made a video predicting if Apple was going to keep the Mac Pro, they would have a refresh by March. I was incorrect. The refresh occurred in April, if you want to call it that. Actually, Apple did something a little different. They basically lowered the $4,000 machine uh, to $3,000, and then they took their 8-core build-to-order machine and priced it for $4,000. Same basic hardware. Nothing's really changed with the machine itself other than a price cut. So, not really a refresh, is it? Just a price drop, and now you get the former, more high-end machine for less money. So, it's not even a refresh. So, I was actually totally wrong about that. However, Apple has committed itself to redesigning the Mac Pro, and they admitted, Phil Schiller admitted, that they had designed themselves into a thermal corner with that machine. They did not interpret uh, how the Mac Pro was going to be used. They designed it as a dual GPU machine with certain thermal qualities, and it turns out that designing a machine with a larger, more powerful single GPU is a totally different architecture. Thus, when he's talked about them painting themselves into a thermal uh, corner, Apple is also, uh, uh, they didn't understand exactly the pro market like they thought they did. And it turns out that pro users really do want a modular type machine. I used to have the Cheese Grater Mac Pro 2009. And I loved it for its ability to internally expand that machine by adding additional drives, adding additional GPUs, easily accessible to the RAM, even upgrading the uh, uh, CPUs if that's what you wanted to do. And then Apple kind of did away with that for the most part with the Trash Can Mac Pro, and that has left thousands and thousands of uh, pro users in a quandary as to what to do. And they, a lot of them have moved to the world of Windows or even an iMac they have found sufficient to do their thing. As a matter of fact, I, I know I've got a couple of viewers very passionate about how well the technology in the current Mac Pro, the Trash Can Mac Pro, has held up over the years and that is still a great value. We, uh, we have a somewhat agreement to disagree on that. And, but Apple has admitted it's, it's a mistake. The machine was a mistake. They miscalculated the use case of the machine and how much it was and how, what the workload was going to be on it. And now they're going back to the drawing board with a new design. I think we may see the first preview of that machine in the 2018 WWDC. Uh, and with production actually ramping up in 2019, I don't think you'll be able to get that your hands on that machine for quite some time. They're also talking about building a professional level display, probably an 8K display. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Apple also said, you know what, we've got a lot of users that are going to that iMac. And so they're, apparently they're working on a pro version of the iMac. That may be the machine that gets the eyeballs. We'll see. I want to get your thoughts about the Mac Pro. And do you do you think it's still a machine worth considering? You know, I just see content creators. That's you know what you see. You see the the uh, Casey Neistats and you see others, the MKBHDs, all basically saying the same thing. They can get more performance when it comes to rendering 4K video out of a current MacBook Pro than they can the expensive trash can Mac. And ultimately, that's where the value of the machine comes in. What you get and performance wise, performance wise by what you pay for it. Now, the question of the week uh, it comes from Christoph Blazewitz, who writes, Thanks for my content. I've uh, been sick. Hey, so get well soon. Hopefully, you're going to beat this thing. You're going to beat this thing. And uh, he, he has a question that is common to tech YouTubers like myself. All right, here's the question. Uh, he mentions Chris Perillo is the first internet celebrity YouTuber because he started mostly on uh, PBS when he's seen them, long before there was YouTube. Yes, he did a show called Call for Help on Tech TV. 
I think he did that for a couple of years. Um, he did that as a tech reviewer and a tech expert. Um, he also says, uh, can you answer if you can have time, which I do right at the moment, how a person became so good at doing YouTube without, uh, without being like Chris Brillo with no media TV support? And by the way, happy birthday, Bruce. Thank you. Appreciate the uh, birthday uh, wishes. All right. So, you know, that's a great question. It requires a lot of thought. And I can, hopefully you're not referring to me because I have a very small channel in the grand scheme of things. And I do this out of a passion to create content, uh, not because I am going to get a million subscribers or anything like that. But if you look at people like uh, MKBHD, Marquez Brownlee, Austin Evans, uh, the Linus, Linus Tech Nips, uh, if you look at Casey Neistat and others, and try to reverse engineer their success on YouTube a little bit. And I think they have some very similar things in common. One is they all do really hard work. They really work hard at perfecting their cra uh, craft. Whether it's technology reviews or whether it's uh, filmmaking, whatever it is they're passionate about, they have. you're seeing the end result of years and years and years of a lot of hard work. They also have a very strong understanding of what their audience wants to see. They're very well connected with their audience and they don't deviate from what their audience wants them to do. Maybe Nystat does a little bit and he'll experiment with some stuff, but ultimately, just like when he gave up vlogging to do other stuff, he came back to vlogging because he that's what his audience really wants is his daily, vo uh, daily vlogs. So the content that they produce on a very consistent basis is a very high quality. Hell, even I'm capable of producing a high quality video every once in a while, but more times than not, they're probably not the best quality. These guys tend to nail it much more frequently. Now, admittedly, this is their full-time job, but it wasn't always their full-time job. But I'm quite sure if I had the time to invest in it, perhaps uh, my quality would be uh, a little bit higher as well. And I also think there might be just a smidge of luck in there somewhere, but I'm discounting that very heavily. And finally, the last component. And this is the one I think that's the hardest for, for me to wrap my mind around, and probably for a lot of other people, and that is the it factor, as I call it. What makes celebrities a box office draw at movies? What, what makes them different than ordinary folk walking around? And that is because they have it, that magnetic personality thing that grab, makes people gravitate to them and be interested in them and it's, it's hard to put define exactly what that is but you either have it or you do not and is it personality is it looks is it is it a combination of factors i can't quite put my finger on it but i know it when i see it and you do too uh, we tend just to gravitate to certain people and so i think the it factor uh, plays a vital role in the success on YouTube. I don't think I have it, <laughs> but uh, I wish I did, but it is what it is. See, that's kind of a play. Oh, never, oh, never mind. That is uh, a tough question. It's a great question. It's a interesting question, and I'm sure that the PewDiePies of the world probably don't even sit and think about that anymore, but at one time, they probably did. Thank you for your question. I answered it to the best of my ability. And join me next week for another installment of Coffee Break. Thanks so much. Take care.